I'd just like to make a statement. Um, the Berkeley Public Library acknowledges that we sit on the unceded traditional lands of the Ohlone people, and we honor with gratitude the land itself, as well as the Ohlone people who still work and play in this region. We stand in solidarity with all marginalized people and celebrate differences that contribute to the strength of our community. Everyone is welcome here at the Berkeley Public Library. All right, so today's speakers are Diana Lau and Melissa Johnston. Um, they are both behavioral neuro neuroscientists um, who are at who are working on postdocs at the at the University of Tubington um, in a crow lab dis, uh, studying the um, cognitive ability of crows. And they will be talking to us about avian intelligence today. So go ahead, Diana and Melissa, and take it away. Cool. All right. Share screen. Oh, yes. You'd think after a year of doing this, you'd be pretty good at it. <laughs> this one? Oh, uh, no, that's us. Right here. This one. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, yeah. This way and swap. This one? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Kelsey, can you see our screen? Can you hear us okay? Yes, we can hear you and we can awesome. see your screen. Cool. Yes. Okay. Great. All right, cool. Well, we'll get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you for Kelsey and the Berkeley Public Library for inviting us. Today, our talk is titled Brilliant Birds and Their Brains, or as we like to say, Bird-brained and brilliant. So the reason for our title is that historically, people have had many misconceptions about birds and their brains. And we wanted to reclaim this phrase. Uh, so hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll believe that birds are super cool and so are their brains. Uh, but before we start, we wanted to kind of introduce ourselves a little bit more. Okay, uh, and why we study birds. So this is me. Uh, and when I was young, or in this picture, not that young, uh, I knew that when I grew up, I wanted to be a dinosaur. So sadly, I learned that this was impossible. And so what I do now is I study the closest things, uh, birds. So birds have evolved from a group of two-legged carnivore dinosaurs called theropods. And this is the same group of dinosaurs that the mighty T-Rex belonged to even though birds descended from a smaller theropod. So they got even smaller, they developed feathers and wings, lost their teeth, gained a beak, and even now, some of them look like modern dinosaurs. And so um, I wanted to share a couple of my favorite birds. So here, uh, this one is a shoebill stork, and I think it looks a lot like a dinosaur. It's four and a half feet tall, it lives in the swamps of Africa, and it can even hunt baby crocodiles. Um, this is a tawny frogmouth down here. I just think they look really cute. <laughs> and then last but not least, uh, up here, I really like crows, and they're actually what we're studying. Uh, so crows and I share a lot of similarities. Uh, for example, I really like shiny things. Cool. And for me, if you um, hadn't already noticed, I have a bit of a strange accent, and that is because I'm from New Zealand. And being an island, weird things happen on islands. So for a lot of our birds, they've evolved very specific uh, characteristics that are honestly not very useful for um, survival of the species. So I just wanted to point out a couple of my favorite. The first is the kiwi bird which of course represents um, people from New Zealand as well. An interesting fact about them is that they're the only bird species to have their nostrils at the end of their beak as opposed to um, at the base of it. Um, we also have the kākāpō, which is the world's heaviest parrot and only flightless parrot, not useful. Uh, the kereru, which is our native wood pigeon, these guys are notorious for eating fermented fruit, getting drunk and falling out of trees. They're super cute. And the hoiho, which is the yellow-eyed penguin, <laughs> which is thought to be the world's rarest penguin, potentially because it is 
incredibly antisocial and tries to communicate with high pitched screams. So for me personally, I was surrounded by all these birds growing up and I just wanted to keep um, being involved with birds. So this is a picture of me from uh, part of my PhD studies where I spent some time in another lab in Germany working with jackdaws, but I've also worked with pigeons. And now as Diana said, uh, we work with the crows. So yes, this is why we study birds. But let's get into it. So I just wanted to start off by highlighting um, how diverse birds are. So there are over 10,000 different species of birds. And here we've got a great uh, figure of the sort of evolution of all the different species. So each branch here is where they've diverged from other birds. And right here in the middle is their last common ancestor, which was between 150 and 165 million years ago. And so each of these birds uh, hold a very specific um, or occupy a very specific niche in the environment. For example, we've got the seabirds and shorebirds up here, but then we've also got some more um, commonly seen birds down here like the pigeon and, and chickens. And then we've got some parrots over here. And basically there are a lot of bird species. And so they are very cool, super diverse. But thinking back to, um, you know, how birds have been represented in society, they've always held this really highly symbolic um, value to people. And most often the symbolic meaning has come through in terms of representing a link between the human plane or the earth and the celestial plane. So heavens and say um, places after death. For example, um, sparrows, they're thought to be soul catchers in ancient Egyptian culture. And they've also been thought of as a, a guide between um, taking souls between heaven, uh, world and heaven. And so that's why a lot of sailors have had tattoos of sparrows, so that if they get lost out at sea or if they die out at sea, then they have these sparrows on them to help guide them through to the afterlife. And of course, another bird that is uh, quite often used as a tattoo is the phoenix. And this is meant to represent new birth or um, rebirth or new life. Um, but there's, there's a lot of other examples I could give. Um, America, for example, um, just like New Zealand, chose a bird to represent them. And so for America, the bald eagle represents strength, courage, and freedom. So we use these birds in really... Uh, symbolic meanings. But moving more towards the sci scientific uh, value of the birds in history, we know that birds were really important for Darwin's theory of evolution. So when he went to the Galapagos Islands, he noticed that a lot of the finches there had different beaks. And so as I mentioned earlier, weird things happen on islands. And so what happened here is that the birds um, evolved different styles of beaks because of different selection pressures based on the food they had available to them. So they needed to adapt uh, their beak so that they could access different food and survive as a species. And also people just love birds. People love them as a pet. For example, Mike Tyson here, absolutely love pigeons, bless him. At one point, he had over 350 pigeons living on his roof, which, you know, to some people that seems like too many, but, you know, he does his thing. But also a lot of celebrities and um, weirdly, a lot of American uh, presidents and high ranking officials have also had pets in the past, including um, JFK, um, LBJ, uh, and other people like Steven Spielberg and uh, yeah, lots of people. Anyway, so to a lot of people, birds are really important. They're really loved, but for some people they don't value them so much. And so what has happened is we've come to have this term bird brain. So for those of you who are not familiar with this term, the Merriam-Webster dictionary defines it as a stupid person or a scatterbrain. 
And other synonyms include cuckoo, dits, feather brain, feather head, and flibbertigibit. Flibbertigibit? Flibbertigibit. Flibber um, but with such a rich symbolic and scientific history, how did our feathered friends become known to be stupid or represent being stupid? It all started um, in a philosophical sense, in terms of having ignorant preconceptions. So in medieval Christian culture, there was this belief that you could rank animals on a hierarchy, or actually you could rank everything on a hierarchy of intelligence. And so at the top of the ladder here, we have celestial beings. So heaven, God, angels, this all-knowing, all um, intelligent sort of representation that we should all strive towards. And down at the bottom we have minerals and soils and, and rocks and things that don't really do a lot, I guess, in, in a behavioral sense. Um, and this is the, above that we've got behavioral organisms, so really basic um, things like mussels and um, even plants. And here we have animals sort of smack bang in the middle before the humans. But within this, we could also look at how animals were ranked within um, a category. So here we have um, some cute little insects and, and bugs down the bottom with some spiders. And then these more, um, I guess, ocean-based animals followed by reptiles, birds, and then this large group at the top is mammals. So we have the dolphins and whales, the rest of the four-legged um, mammals, and then our closest uh, relatives, chimpanzees, great apes, and monkeys. Um, and so, as I said, the birds are represented right here in the middle. So they weren't seen as incredibly unintelligent, but they also weren't given enough credit in terms of how intelligent they actually are. Moving on, um, there, fair enough. Uh, moving on from the philosophical to the more scientific or more um, experimental, uh, this, this cartoon accurately represents the, the necessity to think about ecological um, considerations when designing experiments. So, it states here that for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And there's actually a quote that has been um, misattributed to Einstein, which is, everybody's a genius, but if we judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life thinking it's stupid. So, so this sort of just really emphasizes that um, we need to take into account other things when actually looking to see if animals are intelligent. And I just want to highlight an example specific to birds. And this is uh, their vision or their visual system. And so I'm going to use humans as the comparison. So if we think about their field of view, so this is what you can see at any given time. Looking down this human head, it can see roughly just around here. But if we look at the bird's field of vision, they can actually see almost all the way around, with the exception of owls, because their eyes are at the front of their head. So having the eyes at the side of the head means they can see a lot more. There is a lot more entering their brain at any given time. Moreover, they have a much higher um, processing rate of What's it called? They can process more frames per second than humans can. So humans can process about 60 frames per second, and that looks like this. There's a little fly here, it's zooming around, it's very quick. But what that looks like to birds down the bottom here is quite slow because they're able to intake this information at a lot higher rate or a lot quicker. So that means if we played birds a video, they're not gonna see it the same way we do. They're more likely to see it as a series of frames. Or if you think about those books where you draw 
uh, pictures in the corner and you flick through it, that's more like what they would be able to see. But perhaps even more remarkable is their, um, the, the way that they process color. So we have these cells in our eyes called cones and they're responsible for um, intaking color. Color, yeah. yeah, color processing. And so we have three of them, one centered around blue, one centered around green and one centered around red. And so this allows us to see all the colors in the rainbow. Birds, however, have an additional cone, which although represented here in pink, it is not actually pink, it is ultraviolet. And so what that means is while we see a bird looking somewhat like this, what they might see is something like this. So unfortunately, we will never be able to tell you exactly what the birds can see because we can just physically not process what they are processing. Um, so yes, so when designing experiments, we need to make sure that say we're testing whether, you know, they can tell the difference between two shades of red. You know, we show them two of them, to us it looks the same, to them it might look completely different. And so this is a really biologically based example, but I just want to give another example from my PhD studies. We had these pigeons and we trained them on an experiment and all but one pigeon got it. And we thought this pigeon is incredibly stupid. <laughs> Why is it not doing this really basic task? But what we ended up noticing is when he was back um, in his aviary, he just didn't eat the corn, which is what we were using as the food reward. And so what we did is we switched out the reward to peas. And just like that, this pigeon got it. He was super smart, really good at the task. And so it's not just these biological factors, it's actually motivational factors and internal states as well that we need to be aware of to make sure we're testing what we think we're testing. Yeah. And so if uh, it's been shown that a bird can't really do something, uh, this absence. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Yep, that one. So we can't take the fact that we haven't seen something to be proof that it doesn't exist. Awesome. Okay, so in addition to antiquated biases against birds and ill-designed scientific experiments, Another factor that led to the preconception that birds aren't that bright was that their brains looked really different from ours. And we like to think that we're, we as humans are quite smart and so our brains must be the best. So here's a picture of a bird brain on the top and the human brain on the bottom. And you can see that they look very, very different. So the bird brain is smooth and the human brain is super wrinkly and has lots of folds. In fact, it actually looks to me almost like a maze. So if you then cut the brain in half, we can look at the inside of it. So here, these images are the brains that have been sliced down the middle, and you can dip these slices into a dye that causes neurons to turn purple. So neurons are cells that communicate with each other in your brain, and also from your brain to your body. So they're super important. And these slices also look very different. Uh, finally, when you take a microscope and zoom way, way in uh, these slices, you can make out more details on how these neurons are organized. So on the top, uh, birds have a very nuclear organization to their neurons. Uh, the neurons tend to cluster together and make these circles. Whereas on the bottom, humans and other mammals in general have a layered organization. So the neurons are lined up in these sheets, kind of like uh, tiers of a cake. Okay. And so over the last few decades, uh, modern techniques and thinking have led to a wealth of research showing that birds can actually do some uh, really cool things. And so I found this cute YouTube video where someone taught their pet parrot to skateboard and I wanted to share it with you guys.
Nice. Uh, so this is a really impressive display of motor skills. Uh, but now we're going to move on and present some of the more compelling cognitive studies to argue that birds are super smart. Okay. So the first study, um, one persistent question is that that we always think about is um, what makes us humans unique? Like what separates us uh, from other non-primate animals? And one early hypothesis was tool use. So we have opposable thumbs and are thus pretty dexterous. Um, we are constantly using tools. This is uh, Shoda, one of my favorite Top Chef contestants from last season, uh, peeling a potato. Here is a capuchin uh, who's using this heavy rock to open up a nut. Here's a chimp that found a long stick and is sticking it into this termite mound to go fishing for termites. And all of these tools basically allow us to do things that would be impossible or much more difficult to do with our bare hands. And uh, additionally, there's been a lot of evidence uh, that tool use emerged early in human history. So here are some pictures of uh, primitive rock tools that have been dated to 26 million years ago. Okay. However, this hypothesis has been proven wrong uh, when examples of non-primate animals using tools emerged. So one such example uh, are the New Caledonian crows. And just for reference on this map, this is New Zealand where Millie is from. And just above that is New Caledonia, which is a small isolated island. So in such environments, uh, food can be hard to get sometimes. And these crows eat everything. They eat eggs, small mammals, snails, nuts, and seeds. But one source of food that is delicious and nutritious uh, that they really like are insect larvae. And these larvae like to hide in cracks and crevices. And so these crows were observed to use sticks to probe the crack, wiggle it around to attach the bug, withdraw it, and eat it. Um, so sometimes they just pick uh, up a stick from the ground and it'll generally be pretty straight. And this is kind of tool use. Uh, other times they'll manipulate the end of the stick a little bit to form a hook uh, to get at those hard to reach places. And this would be considered tool manipulation. Oh no, I forgot the citation. It's a cool paper. Um, <laughs> So even more complicated is the use and manufacturing of multiple tools, which is considered a uh, more complex cognitive ability than using a single tool. So we used to be in New Caledonia over here, and now we move a little bit further to the Tanimbar Islands of Indonesia, and uh, they have Goffin's cockatoos here. And these cockatoos have been observed um, performing complicated motor sequences. And one of their favorite foods is the seed uh, in this very complicated nut and fruit. So they like to eat this white seed at the very middle, but it is very well protected by many different layers. And so to get at the seed, uh, the cockatoos manufacture and use three different tools at different stages. Uh, first, they use a sturdy stick. Um, as kind of a wedge to separate the two halves of uh, the nut a bit. Second, they use a fine tool, so a much thinner stick, as in a vertical motion through this wedge and wiggle it around uh, to the middle of the nut and break it open. And then finally, they use a medium stick here to scoop out the exposed nut and then they get to eat it. So, um, I have a video of this process. Uh, and in the first half, they show the bird using these three tools. And in the later half, they show how they manufacture these tools. Side of the fruits and the carp. Fine tools seem to have been used to pierce the mantle surrounding the seed material. and ultimately medium-sized tools were used to extract the seed material. Furthermore, 
is we found distinct differences in the manufacturing process between wedges and the other tools. Wedges were manufactured by severing a branch and processing the remaining stuff. And in medium tools, on the other hand, were crafted by splitting fragments of a branch, which were further modified in the beak. Yeah. So I thought it was actually pretty amazing how complex this behavior is, given that the bird is uh, using its beak to do all of these things, and it's just using its claws to hold this nut. Cool. So going back to the uh, New Caledonian crows, I'm going to show you some work done to look at causal reasoning. So causal reasoning is the process of identifying the relationship between cause and effect, or the fact that A causes B. And so one way to do this is with the water displacement test, which comes from Aesop's fable of the crow and the picture, as shown here. In this fable, the crow is really thirsty, and there's a jug with some water in it. So what the crow decides to do is pick up some stones and put the stones in the water to displace the water, rising it so that he can take a drink. So the object pushes the volume of water that is equal to its own volume. If it is an item that sinks, if it's an item that floats, then it's completely useless. So this is the water displacement test. And so this is actually quite easy to, um, to train animals to do. It's an easy setup. So for example, here we have our New Caledonian crow and we have a tube full of water. And sitting at the top here is a tasty retreat that he really wants. And so what the crow needs to do is uh, select from these items down the bottom here um, to raise the water up. And so let's see what he does. How cool. So what you might have noticed there is that he uh, grabbed an item and threw it away. So some of these items were light and some of them were heavy. So these light ones did not sink um, in water. So I might just play that again. Here's a heavy item. He's thinking, yep, this is cool. And here's this really light item. And he's saying, nope, that's not going to help me. Great. Um, in a similar uh, paradigm, they still used the single tube, but this time they had items that were either solid or hollow. So the hollow items are not going to displace water very much, but the solid items will. And of course, he only uses the solid items. Clever wee bird. Why don't we make it a little bit more difficult? And now we have two tubes. So in this situation, one tube is filled with water and the other one is filled with sand. So while putting items in the first tube will cause the treat to rise, putting items in the sand tube will not have any effect. Okay, um, so while we don't see him get the reward, I can confirm that the guy does get the reward. But basically this video highlights that he ignores the sand and only goes for the water. Let's make it a little more complicated again. What happens when the tubes are not the same size? So here we have a wide tube and a narrow tube. Ideally, the crow will only go for the narrow tube because the displacement um, there's less water to be displaced. Oh, he doesn't seem happy about that. 
much better. Yeah. Good job, mate. So while the bird struggles a little bit with this concept, he still does get there in the end. And in one more, even more difficult, the most difficult condition uh, they test in these crows, we have three tubes. And what we can't see and what the bird can't see is that this middle tube with the reward in it is actually connected to one of these outer tubes. So the idea is that he needs to put the items into the wider tube um, in order to cause a displacement to the middle one. Let's see what happens. Cool, so now we know that it's the red tube that is connected. Putting an item in the blue one does nothing. Listen, I'm trying the middle one. So eventually he does get this reward. But the authors concluded that, um, you know, while, while he could get through some of these, but not these more difficult ones, crows have an understanding of the basic concepts of cause and effect, but not a complete understanding. So they still struggle with more complex, um, perhaps um, in this case, not obviously linked cause and effect uh, relationships. Cool. And so now we're going to transition from the physical uh, to the mental. So theory of mind is the capacity to perceive and understand mental states. And one of the processes is mental state inference, uh, where we can understand how others feel, we can kind of infer their wants, and how we can affect them. And so to study mental state inference, we can take advantage of a specific phenomenon called the specific satiety phenomenon. Wow, you said the exact same <laughs> words. Uh, and this was work that one of our friends, Katarina, uh, did for, was involved in for her PhD. So just for illustration purposes, um, say you really love chips and you also really love strawberries and you love them both equally. Um, so you get hungry uh, one night and you eat a whole pile of chips and your uh, partner is watching you lovingly. So two hours later, uh, you get hungry again, and then you ask your partner to get you a snack. So your partner, knowing that you like chips and strawberries equally, and had already had a ton of chips, uh, so what would they choose to bring you? And uh, the tasty strawberries would be the right choice, uh, because you had already eaten chips before, and uh, now you, you might want to eat something else right now that you equally uh, like. And so they ran this study with Eurasian J couples where the male is trying to impress the female. So the female equally likes uh, wax moth larvae and also mealworm larvae here. So she's given first access to a lot of uh, wax moth larvae and she has a very satisfying meal while the male is watching. Okay, and at a later time, this male is given the choice between the uh, mealworm larvae and also the wax moth larvae uh, to bring to her. Okay, and he'll tend to choose the mealworm larvae for her snack. And so this choice uh, kind of reveals that he has some understanding of how she's feeling and what she would be in the mood to eat. Cool. So sticking with food and worms and all things tasty, I'm just going to show this video of a scrub jay uh, or a jay hiding some of its food. So like a lot of birds, um, these jays will hide their food for later consumption. And you might have noticed that they actively grab bits to, uh, to cover it so that it can't be seen. So this produces, this natural behavior produces a really great opportunity to test for memory of what, where, and when, which is somewhat crucial when we think about um, say event memory or the memories that we have of past events. We remember what, where, and when something occurred. And so to test this in a lab, 
we have um, quite often trays such as this and birds are given um, food over here in the corner and they're allowed to go cash it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be these um, outdoor type of setup. We can move inside and test using other equipment such as this. So uh, looking at caching memory in scrub jays, say up here we have this tray represented. Um, so this bird here, this is the tray it sees. Just for ease of explanation, I have colored some of these wells red and some of them blue. And so what uh, Clayton and colleagues did is they allowed the birds to cache uh, peanuts, which are quite a valuable item. Birds really love peanuts, especially our crows, actually. But birds love peanuts, right? They're great and they last a really long time. So they're a great item to cache because it gives them longer between when they have to return to them. So these birds cache these in all of the red locations. Then five days later, they were given the option or the opportunity to cache worms. And so as Diana mentioned earlier, larvae and other um, meaty sort of rewards, I guess, are much more valuable. But the problem with these rewards is that they degrade or they break down and, and die very quickly. So five days later, they cache these. In other um, situations, it was done in the opposite order. So first they cache the worms and then they cache the peanuts. So what they wanted to see is whether these birds would go um, and look for the worms or the peanuts. So four hours later, they were given the option to um, to go looking for these items that they'd already hidden. So for this first condition where the worms were recently cached, they found that the birds went back for the worms. Super tasty, really loved them. But in the second condition where the worms were cached uh, five days earlier, they weren't in as good a condition. And so what they found is that the birds opted for the peanut because it sort of suggests that they knew that the worm would be, um, would have broken down to a point where it wouldn't be worth eating. So this somewhat simple design is a really great way to test the, um, the what, where, when memory, because it covers where things were cached, what was cached, and also when things were cached. So this is a really impressive um, experiment from an excellent lab. Uh, showing these more complex uh, behaviours in birds. Okay, uh, really cool study. Um, moving on. So the next topic is one that is near and dear to our lab. Uh, so our lab does a lot of studies on numerical competence because numbers and maths in general uh, are pervasive in our lives and also in the wild. And one example of the wild uh, that I really like is uh, brood parasitism. So here is a warbler nest with beige eggs. Well, not sure if it's a warbler, but it's a nest with beige eggs. You can kind of see here, there's also uh, a blue speckled egg in there. And so a different species of bird, uh, for example, a common cuckoo, has snuck into this nest and laid an egg. And we have terms for uh, birds like this cuckoo, which is a brood parasite, because they don't take care of their own chicks, but kind of depend on other species of birds to do so. And so brood parasites have been known to prefer nests with a certain number of eggs already laid in them. And they do this to kind of time when their own chick would hatch and get cared for by the host bird. Uh, so, uh, this is a picture of a hatched cuckoo chick, and this is the uh, host mom, a warbler. And what's kind of funny is you can see this chick is uh, much bigger, and it's constantly hungry. And so the parents must be exhausted trying to feed this giant chick that isn't even theirs. And so you can imagine that such a situation as this is generally unwanted. And so some host species use counting in addition to visual comparisons to kind of reject parasitic eggs. So they count their own eggs 
and try and figure out if an extra one got snuck in there. Um, so that was in the wild, uh, but I wanted to talk about how our lab studies numerosity. So here's a picture of uh, our crows, or one of our crows, and he is perched in front of a touchscreen monitor, looking at a circle with a number of dots inside. So on the side uh, here is a task matic of what he has to do. So it looks complicated, but I'll go through it step by step. So first, uh, the trial starts with the zero, and then after a few seconds, a circle with dots will appear. So here, there are three dots here. Uh, next, the dots disappear for a second, and then another circle with dots appear. And what the crow has to do is he has to decide whether the second circle has the same number of dots as the first circle or not. So on the bottom here, uh, these three dots match these three dots, and so he has to peck the screen. On the top, five dots is not three dots, so he kind of has to wait a little bit. And then 800 milliseconds later, another circle appears, and here, three dots, and that's when he pecks the screen. Um, and to make sure that the actual number of dots is what he is using and not other visual cues, uh, we can use a whole series of controls. So for example, this is the standard set of dots. And the more dots there are, the more black is like present in your visual field, just one dot and then five dots. Uh, and on the bottom row, we wanna control for this uh, no amount of black in your visual field. And so all of these stimuli have an equal area and density. And so this one single black dot uh, has as much black as these five smaller dots. Okay, and so crows do pretty well um, on this task. Uh, and also they exhibit a couple of behavioral signatures of the approximate number system uh, that are the magnitude effect and also the distance effect. So uh, when they do this task, they show this magnitude effect where um, they're much better at smaller numbers compared to larger numbers. So one is easier than five. They also show this distance effect where if the crows make a mistake, they tend to do it in a very systematic way. Um, so they're more likely to make a mistake when the number is closer to the target versus when it's further away. And this is explained by the fact that it's easier to distinguish between, for example, one and five, than it is to distinguish between four and five. <clears throat> So another experiment that is near and dear, at least to my heart, is one that comes from my PhD or my graduate lab. And this was uh, word recognition in pigeons. So word recognition relies on a process called orthographic processing. When we see this four letter combination, B-I-R-D, we recognize this as being a word. We understand it reads as bird. If we rearrange these to B, D, I, R, we also recognize that this is not a word. And we can very clearly distinguish between these two as being word and not word. But what happens when we just switch these inner two letters? B, R, I, D, brid. It sounds like a word and it kind of looks like a word, but it's not actually a word. So why do we process this as being a word? This is based on bigram frequencies, which is simply how often pairs of letters occur together. So B, R, R, I, and I, D occur together quite often in the English language, but B and D do not occur together. So we can instantly say, okay, any combination where B and D are next to each other, this is not a word. But this is why we get confused because we're used to seeing these pairs uh, together quite often. And so what uh, my colleagues in the lab did is they tested this in pigeons. And so what they did is they presented them with words or with non-words. And their goal was to distinguish them. So if they saw a word, they had to peck on the word specifically. And if they saw a non-word, they had to peck on the star. So I'm just going to show you the video of 
um, just because the words or the letter combinations are very small, um, I've included them here. And the order that they appear is fur, grr, gray, fret, book, and bust. So when he ducks down, that's when he's getting rewarded. Is he eating corns or peas? Oh, this guy's eating wheat. Wheat? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so interestingly, this was this bird's first day on the task. So here that he's just learning what to do. He understands the concept, but he doesn't know the words per se. And so uh, what they found is that the pigeons could distinguish up to 80, uh, 58 four-letter words from nearly 8,000 non-letter, uh, non word combinations. And so after they finished training this, what they did is they presented the birds with new words and tested whether they uh, perceived them as being words or non-words. And what they found is that quite often the words they correctly identified as being words and the non-words again as not being words. And then they took this a little bit further by doing um, the switching the inner uh, letters and found that they um, do a similar thing to humans. So while they, um, if it looked more like a word, they would attribute it as being a word, but if it didn't look like a word, they would attribute it as not a word. So what this shows is that it's not just the letters themselves that are important, but the order in which they are important and how they combine with the letters around them. So, for now, while they can recognize words versus non-words, they we haven't found any evidence yet that they can attach meaning to these words and therefore read more complex um, combinations of words. So yeah, but watch the space. Who knows? Maybe one day they'll rent a, a Stephen King novel. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, next is vocalization. And vocalization is a topic that is of special interest to me uh, because it's what I study. So we are constantly communicating through language. Um, I'm giving this talk right now, uh, but babies are not born fluent in a language. They're constantly, um, depend they're dependent on social interaction to learn language, uh, usually from adults. Um, and they traverse through multiple developmental stages. So very early on, young babies basically only cry and make cooing noises. And then they progress on to making simple speech sounds uh, such as like ba. And this goes into babbling where you have strings of simple speech sounds and this eventually turns into real words. And what's kind of cool is that these developmental stages have a critical period or time in their life uh, where they have to occur. So one example is learning a second language. So as a kid, uh, kids are sponges and they can pick up a second language quite easily. That was a good snap. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's the best snap yet. <laughs> and as adults, um, when you try to master another language, you know how hard it can be. So Millie and I have uh, some personal experience. We moved to Germany a couple years ago and wow, like German is a really hard language to learn. So um, we're sprechen nur ein bisschen Deutsch. Ah, oh, sehr gut. <laughs> That's about all we've mastered. <laughs> and kind of what drew me to this topic of vocalization is that the evolution of human speech and language is one of the great mysteries. So we communicate very easily by talking, we talk a lot, uh, but our closest relatives, apes and other old world monkeys are not super vocal. They actually prefer to use more gestures to communicate. And also their babies are born already able to make all the sounds that the adults will make. And so these babies still have to learn when and kind of where to use their calls, but they never learn to make new sounds. 
And then further back, we have more vocal species. So we have the smaller New World monkeys, we have whales and dolphins, and of course we have birds. Uh, so some birds are known to have uh, vocal imitation learning. And the female chooses her mate by his song. Uh, so it's really important for him to teach his sons how to sing. So the juveniles also go through several developmental stages from babbling to subsong to plastic song before reaching crystallized song. And this is the song that they'll sing for the rest of their lives. And it always gets stuck on this one slide for some reason. Okay. Um, so here's a video of some examples. Uh, it'll start off with the father's song, and then you'll show the son's song at different um, stages, so days post-hatch. Um, and basically, as they get older and older, their song becomes more and more complex and more and more similar to their father's song. This is the father song. Okay, um, so that's their beautiful song. And zebra finches learn this one song and they'll use it to serenade females uh, for their entire lives. But the songbird family is quite heterogeneous. Okay. Um, so canaries uh, also sing, but they're not a one hit wonder like the zebra finch but release a new track every single year. And so what that means is uh, they learn a new song every single spring to impress the ladies, and then they forget about it in the fall. And what's actually really cool is that their brains also get bigger and smaller with song in the seasons. And so here in particular, one of the nuclei of their brains called the HVC, which is important for song, actually doubles in size. Um, so in the canary case, bigger is better, but absolute uh, brain size is not the best predictor of intelligence. And when we think about all the different bird species, they generally have quite small heads and such smaller brains. But uh, as we've shown, sometimes their behavioral performance are on par with primates, uh, like this macaque monkey, which has a much bigger brain. And so, uh, Instead of absolute size, we can also look at relative size. So here is a figure um, with a bunch of different species. And um, here is uh, the body size and here is the brain size. And you can see that most mammals fall along this line here uh, with the elephant uh, at the very top. And on top of this one line, there are two different uh, groups. One of them is the primates, so humans up here, uh, and rest of the primates here, and also this orange group, which are the birds. And uh, so this is the same graph, body uh, size on the bottom here. And on the side, instead of looking at the size of the brain, we have the number of neurons in the brain. And uh, remember, neurons are those important cells. Okay. So when we look at the number of neurons, we uh, see again that orange and red, the birds and the primates, separate themselves from the rest of these other animals. And so it's been thought that the number of neurons uh, can be a biological correlate of cognitive capacity. Okay. So we also briefly touched upon uh, different parts of the brain. Uh, so for these figures, I want you to kind of just focus on the colors and not really the word labels. Uh, so this is a human brain, and you can see that all the folds of this brain are uh, green. 
And this green part represents the pallium, which is thought to be the part of the brain where intelligent behavior uh, arises. And there's a lot of green on this human brain. And so historically, it was thought that uh, in birds, since they don't really have these layers, that the analogous green bits, the pallium, is uh, very small. So there's only this tiny sliver here at the very top, and also this bump here in the front. However, with recent experiments, uh, the classification of, and a lot of discussion, the classification of these areas have changed. And now, as you see here, there's a lot more green in the bird brain. And so terminology is important for shaping how we think about brains and also the uh, associated behavior of these animals. Okay. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, there's also been differences between different species of birds, uh, because Millie said there's like over 10,000 of them. And so they wanted to see um, what makes some birds potentially smarter than other birds. So here are uh, a few different bird species and a slice of their brains um, underneath them. And so we have the pigeon, chicken, ostrich, and uh, corvids, or this is a crow. And in green, uh, similar to the previous one, is a part of the brain uh, called the nidopallium. And this is one that's been compared to a lot to the primate prefrontal cortex. And they all have this green region. So when you go into this green region and you count the number of neurons, uh, what do you find? And you basically find that corvids, uh, which are considered very smart, have much more paleo uh, neurons than other bird species. So they have more than the pigeon and the chicken, and also more than the much larger ostrich. And so this idea is that uh, they are, have smaller brains, but their brains are scaled larger than the size of their body, uh, but they also have many more neurons. And so um, some of our take home messages uh, would be that Science is always evolving, and so is our understanding of birds, because uh, we try to figure out what birds can do very early on. And more techniques and methods and uh, careful discussions have led to better experiments. And we're scientists right now, and we're also trying to design more experiments to learn more about birds. Okay. Uh, bird behavior is pretty amazing. I hope you guys enjoyed all of the videos. Um, yeah, what was your favorite? Of the videos? Yeah. I like when the crow gets the wee reward out of the tube. Yeah, the you water looks so happy. Yeah. Um, and also bird brains are amazing. So they pack all of this uh, processing power and computational power into such a small brain. Yeah. But most importantly, regardless of, um, of what you liked or didn't like or did take from this uh, talk, we just want you to remember that being bird-brained is brilliant. We're reclaiming this term and thinking of it as a positive thing from now on. So yes, thank yeah. you for listening. Um, hope you enjoyed it. All right, thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. Love the videos, love the facts, learned so much. Um, and thank you so much for calling in from Germany too. What time is it over there? Uh, 9 just p.m. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much. Always try to be mindful of that. Um, so please, uh, to our audience, type questions in the chat. Um, I'll ask our in-person audience here if they have any questions. Um, it looks like we do have one in the Q&A from back in the study with the worms and the peanuts. Um, couldn't that study with worms and peanuts also suggest that the birds didn't remember the former items catch? That's a really good question. And so what I tried to do here is um, differentiate these locations um, based on the color. So when they went to retrieve the items, they were all cached in the same tray. And so what they find is that they actually ignore um, where the the previously um, 
So for this example, where the worms were cached first, they just ignore all of these ones here where the worms were cached. And so in reality, um, they're not colored like this, they're all just the same. And so they're actively remembering where they cache the more desirable item and ignoring the other ones. Does that clarify that? All right, and another question in the Q&A. Thank you for this presentation. You've touched on this, but what are the implications for the emotional life of birds? I've heard of corvid funerals, etc. cetera. Do you, to, do you want me to go? Up to you. Um, I, I mean, I'm not sure if we are at the point where we can attribute emotional states to birds. So we can observe their behavior such as this, these, these funerals, but we can't ascribe emotions to them, partly because we can't just simply ask them. Um, what we can tell you is that, um, what are the implications? I mean, I, we, we can say that you can make birds happier and, and, and not so happy, and we should always strive to make them happier. Yeah. Um, perhaps this suggests that, you know, one day we will be able to find a way to test for their emotional states, mm -hmm. right? Communicate with them. Yeah. And I think another point with the Corvid funerals is that um, we as humans tend to think that we are the center of the world. So we tend to anthropomorphize things a lot. And we're doing that by calling it a funeral. But like, for example, it's really important to kind of look at factors that influence your own survival. And so when you see a dead conspecific, you might want to go check out the environment and like kind of figure out what happens. Mm. Uh, this might be kind of separate from the idea of a funeral. So they might be seeing if there was other, so if there was food around that they should then avoid in the future. Or any right? objects or, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it is really interesting and I'm looking forward to seeing more research come out of this. All right, another question. What does the difference in neuron shape of a bird brain actually mean in terms of intelligence or the way the bird receives slash transmits information versus the human neuron shape? Um, so this is a really active area of study, looking at the morphology of the different neurons. Um, and I didn't really present very much on that. I just presented on the density uh, and the number of neurons. And like one like kind of hypothesis is that uh, birds are able to do so much with a much smaller brain because they pack a lot of their neurons. And so this might affect the connectivity between neurons or maybe gives rise to some sort of circuit motif um, that allows them to more effectively transmit information and maybe have like a faster processing speed or something like that. Um, do you have anything to add? No, I think that covers it. Yeah. I mean, uh, but we don't actually know that much about um, the neuron shape, so yeah. watch the space. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Gail asks, what is the implication that birds and certain other animals can increase and decrease their neurons as needed? Ah, so this is the canaries. Um, so they don't purposely choose to grow and shrink their brains, but it's quite amazing that this is the solution that they've kind of uh, ended up on. And so this study was uh, really controversial when it first came out because um, neurogenesis or the ability to grow new neurons was thought to be something that only happened in development. And so that they were able to um, show that this happened in adults and not only once, but over and over again was really interesting. And so this might mean that um, the number of neurons is related to the complexity of the behavior. So they needed more neurons to sing these really elaborate songs to impress the females, but when they didn't need them anymore, they didn't need these neurons anymore. And so they died off uh, because neurons are actually really energetically expensive. I think your brain takes up what, like 20% of the energy from the food you eat? Depends on the task you're going. <laughs> yeah, okay. But it takes up way more uh, energy of the food you eat than its size would suggest. Yeah. 
And so there might be some interesting um, relationships between number of neurons, energetics, and behavior here. Uh, great question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Cherry asks, any idea why birds didn't dig up the worm sooner or why store a short-term food? So for this experiment specifically, uh, the birds were on a very set schedule. So the, the experimenters controlled what food they had access to and when. So they purposefully only gave them access to the peanut um, first and then the worms later or vice versa. And then they were taken away and brought back into the space with the trays. So in this example, they just did not have the, um, the opportunity to dig things up earlier. But generally speaking, I would suggest that if they, um, if they cached a perishable item, such as the worms, they would return to them much sooner mm -hmm. because it's more beneficial for them to eat them while they're fresh. And then these less perishable items they can go back to later say if they don't find other food sources. Okay, cool. All right, an anonymous attendee asks, do you have a favorite bird and why? So go ahead and each pick a bird. Yep, um, do you want me to go back? let's go back uh, because my favorite bird looks cool and I'm just gonna show it off again. Uh, so yeah, uh, right here, this is my favorite bird. This is a shoe bill, um, stork and it looks like a dinosaur it's four and a half feet tall it lives in the swamps and it can hunt crocodiles so pretty badass bird oh. okay and for me i feel like this is a really unfair question it's like choosing your favorite child <laughs> i mean okay <laughs> what are one of your favorite okay. <laughs> um, i really really like this uh, native wood pigeon from New Zealand. It looks kind of like a regular pigeon, but it is about twice the size and it's beautiful. And you can hear them swooping from really far away because they're so big and heavy. Um, you can hear their wings flapping and it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. and when you see them in the trees, um, you might have missed it, I said that they like to eat fermented fruit, they get really drunk, and they fall out of the trees. They're really silly, silly birds. Um, so that would be my favorite, I think. But it, it's just so hard, because they're all so different. Um, I would say, so far in my career, my favorite to work with has been the crows. Not that I would ever tell my graduate uh, supervisor <laughs> that. <laughs> Hopefully he's not here. Um, but that's just because they're so fun to interact with. Um, and it just makes our life so much fun. Um, for example, um, one of my birds is really, really sassy. And when I first came here, I wore a t-shirt and jeans every day for like, I don't know, six weeks or so. And so he had this well, I assume you had this concept of me wearing t-shirts and jeans. So when I showed up in a singlet top with a bit of skin showing here, he was not happy and he just would not have anything to do with me that day. I had to leave, go get a t-shirt and come back and then he was completely fine. So sometimes they're training us as opposed to we're training them. Yeah. I mean, you have similar things, right? Yeah. <laughs> And they have a lot of personality. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Hard question, though. <laughs> I'm going to ask the librarian question. Do you have any books about birds or podcasts or uh, other Ooh. resources that you really enjoy and would recommend? Um, just, I know that people... Uh, I know that the... Yeah. Um, the experiment, the food caching experiment... Um, was done by a woman, Nikki Clayton, and um, unfortunately, her lab in Cambridge is being shut down, but her and her husband um, wrote an excellent book, and it's got beautiful pictures. Um, I'm just trying to quickly search it on my phone. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. But yeah, I'm, I really like that one. Yeah, yeah, um, or television shows. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are into the board game Wingspan, um, and I know that they just published a bird guide, too, with the same artwork um, that the oh, board game 
I definitely have to check that out. Oops. Okay. Um, you found the yeah, it's called Bird Brain Exploration of um, Avian Intelligence, right? Yeah. Oh my god, you can do it. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So this is a great book. Yeah. By um. Uh, oh, I think it's just by her husband. Yeah. But it's excellent. Yeah, mm -hmm. I recommend that. Oh, excellent. Okay, thank you for sharing. Yes. Yeah. Um, I also play Wingspan. Actually, we both have. Uh, <laughs> Do you have the German version? Uh, and actually, <laughs> so Millie has the English version, but I only have the German version. So I'm learning about a lot of different birds, but only their German names. And it takes yeah. so long in German because you have to like quickly translate stuff on your phone sometimes. Uh, so a large okay. part of my German vocabulary is bird related <laughs> from playing this game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right. Um, well, let me check the Q&A one more time. I don't see any more questions. Um, it's um, about 15 minutes after the talk. Um, so, uh, unless we have another question, I think we're good to sign off for today. Uh, Diana and Melissa, thank you so much for this just fantastic talk. Um, I feel like I learned a little bit of everything about birds and I'm just walking away with so much and looking forward to, I don't know, watching some crows fly around outside and carefully watching the birds at the feeder and having a better idea of how they see the world. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and attendees, thanks for signing in. All right. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. See you. Ciao. Ciao. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> <laughs>